What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. We have Ruben Dua of Dub.com. It's D-U-B-B.com. Check it out. Before I formally introduce Ruben, I want to just point out several other episodes people should check out. Uh, Ruben, you know, I've had a number of SaaS founders over the past you know, decade on the podcast. Uh, the founder of Zapier, check that one out. That was really interesting. I had Pipe Drive. They had, I think, 10,000 customers at the time. Now they think they have over 100,000 customers. Um, A. Weber was on there. And then Gavin Zaklinski, who started Acuity Scheduling, he sold to Squarespace. That was one of my favorites, Ruben. He was a master at user experience oh, yeah. and onboarding free users and turning them into paid customers. I, I love that episode. Just uh, and we'll talk about your onboarding process. I've actually I signed up for Dub, and it's a it's a pretty cool streamlined onboarding process. So we'll definitely nice. talk about that. And uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise Twenty Five. At Rise Twenty Five, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream One Hundred relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We are an easy button for a company to launch and run their podcast. We provide strategy, accountability, and full execution. Um, and for me, Ruben, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that than over the past decade to profile the people in companies I most admire and profile them and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. Uh, Ruben and their company actually has a podcast too. Um, you can check it out. Um, more information at rise25.com. Email us. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. So I'm excited. We have Ruben Dua. He's a co-founder and CEO of Dub, which is a popular video sales platform that helps businesses 30X. So originally when I read that, I was thinking about it, I was like 3X. No, it's it's possibly 30X, um, which is amazing. And they work with uh, 65,000 plus businesses, including well-known organizations, Keller Williams, Grant Cardone, Fannie Mae, and many more, uh, whose sales teams use the platform to produce personalized video messages that boost connections, conversions, and revenues. And they have a, a number of amazing features. I was reading, Ruben, that's like calendar integrations and SMS campaigns and stuff that's like, as a standalone in itself is amazing, like two-way SMS messaging. Yeah. So we're going to get into some of these features, how you decide to actually release these, because they probably take a lot of time, energy to just do one of those things. And Ruben has over 20 years of marketing experience. He's also the author of Click Record, How Overcoming Fear, Storytelling, and Video Marketing Can Change Your Life. Ruben, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for that, that introduction. Um, it has been a, a true, true evolution of this entire process. And and really, it just starts with listening. You know, we've been listening. We've had these huge, big, fat Dumbo ears and just kind of gauging what people are saying, what our user base is saying. Uh, we try to listen as much as we can. You know, not every feature recommendation that we get, we have to implement, obviously. Um, but there are very specific uh, reasons behind everything that we've built at, at the platform. So thank you so much for noticing that. I think um, maybe that's the title of your next book listening the road to a three billion dollar exit or something <laughs> someday right um but talk about the evolution of the technology where it started and yeah. how it's progressed well the earliest story of of how this whole build a landing page with a video on it actually scales back way earlier than the founding story of dub which is 2018 it goes back to when i was a kid and the whole internet was starting to get uh, off the ground and I was a just a just a small kid, young. I was you know a teenager at the time, trying to make sense of all this stuff, you know. And and I realized that obviously the internet was just going to change everything. You know, one of the first startups that I built, it was it was a it was a sort of a social profile. Actually, it was it was a back in 1995 or four or something. It was a long time ago, and it was an early social network. And I was and Friendster I even existing at that time. I don't this even remember. Kind of like before a lot of that stuff. Okay. The, the premise though is I was I remember the first time I put an animated GIF 
on a landing page. And I was like, animated GIFs on landing pages are going to change everything. And then the moment came when a video, I was able to put a, embed a video on a landing page. And the, and the way to do it back then was nasty. It was very gnarly at a huge file. It was an MOV file. It was a, you know, WMV, some really old, old antiquated formats. And then you'd have to embed those on a page. And then as a result, someone could watch a video. And then making it actionable and having them click to another place and do another thing and book a time and a calendar. You know, obviously none of those things were possible at the time. But just this idea of creating a landing page as a clone to a human being or to a story or to a short film or whatever have you, I, I realized that was really going to change everything. And and since since that realization, I've absolutely been on that path. And and now, you know, we we see ourselves helping now. We've had um, over 70,000 people sign up for the Dub platform since we started. You wow. know, these are people in sales. These are people that run um, agencies. These are, um, you know, solopreneurs, SMBs. You know, we have Fortune 500 clients. Um, and they're all really trying to do one simple thing, which is how do I create more relationships? How do I capture my essence, capture my story, connect with someone via content, via landing page, via calls to action, integrations on a page. And how do I streamline the whole co co you know, communication process? And, uh, and that's exactly what we've committed to, to doing. And it's, it's, been, it's been a hell of a ride. I'm, I'm having the time of my life right now. I'm working really hard. Again, listening, you know, building, and and growing and you know really at the end of the day our success is all rooted in other people's success because at the end of the day when you build a sales platform it really doesn't matter what the features are it doesn't matter what the tech is it matters how much people are growing in terms of specifically revenue and income so we're rooted to that Ruben, talk about some of the those inflection points where you were talking about listening mm. right and what someone told you that shifted the the product or a feature. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because in the pre-meeting you asked um you know should should you mention one of the startups before Dub that I had started called Spreeify and I was like, "You know what? Let's not mention that. It's kind of not relevant for this." <laughs> and you know, maybe maybe it is relevant because you know the failures that we go through in order to get to the successes, you know, we don't talk about those. Sometimes we don't want to talk about them. Sometimes sometimes people don't ask about them. But they are absolutely on our path. You know, the obstacle is the way, as I like to say, and that's an old Ryan Holiday, from, yeah, yeah, this book, but yeah, 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 and that, and that's and that's a beautiful thing, and I and I think that you know this idea of failing forward is really important. I think one of the big biggest problems that happens in entrepreneurship and technology development is this idea where an entrepreneur, someone determines that there is a problem in the marketplace, and then determines that they have the viable solution to solve that. And then they go to the marketplace thinking that just because they want a machine that puts the cream cheese on the bagel automatically, that everyone else is going to want that, you know? And then they go to the marketplace and they realize that this device for a hundred bucks, which is super difficult to clean, <laughs> is, is not embraced by the market whatsoever. And as a result, it's like a failure. And, and that's, and the problem with not, and this is a story rooted in listening. The problem is that, the problem here is not how to put cream cheese on the bagel. The problem is how to save time in the morning and how to streamline the, the morning process, you know? And that and if you understand really what the core problem is, then you can actually figure out a solution and say, okay, well, maybe it's not something that puts the cream cheese on the bagel. Maybe it's just the bagel cutter because when I use a knife, it makes a mess and I can cut my fingers. And maybe it's just the, the, the bagel chopper and boom, you got a bagel chopper. And if you can get a patent on that or if you can get first to market and distribute that, <laughs> then you're doing really well. But I think the idea and the point here, though, is that, you know, we can have a general essence of what is broken. But if we think that we have the entire solution ourselves, that's maybe arrogant. And the better solution is to listen and to figure out what is it that people are actually going through. Yeah, focusing on the benefits as opposed to the feature sets, like you were saying, like focusing yeah. on this is the benefit in maybe iterating based on the benefit, not the feature. With Dub, what did, what were people saying early on that shifted what you were doing? Well, I think that in the beginning, it started with how can I how can I get people to just read my emails and respond to my emails? That was the first problem that we were trying to solve, that emails 
Email is the cheapest, freest way to do to run your sales, period. There's no better, cheaper way to do it. Social media is amazing. Um, you know, live webinars, podcasts, it's all amazing. But emails, you can literally go to a company, you can download a list of a million emails and start cold emailing them and just praying that someone's going to respond. And, and it's not easy because it's become very difficult, you know, with with domain uh, domain technology and the way that it sort of blocks, you know, mass emails. But the point was that getting those email responses was very difficult. And the instant realization, which is not rocket science, is that when we add humanity to the process of communication, that people are going to ignore you less. I mean, just think about it for a second. If you pop into an elevator or a coffee shop and someone says hello, you know, if you have decent manners, you're going to say hello back. You're not going to ignore that person. But to ignore an email, on the other hand, there you don't have to have good manners. You can have the best manners on the planet and delete or ignore an email and you're you're good, right? Because that's just not the etiquette. It's not the expectation in, in our society. But the second that you add a smiling face, like when you sent me a dub video, I was like, okay, I, I wanted to sit, reply to you like immediately on the spot because I was like, I'm not going to ignore this. This is amazing, you know? And just think about how powerful that is. It's all that we're doing is bringing ourselves, right? So that was problem number one. And then problem number two is, okay, great. Now we have a response. Well, now how do we get, like, what's the next thing in our funnel? Like, okay, well, we need we need bookings. You know, we need people to go to our website and fill out that form or book a time in my calendar. You know, Acuity Scheduler, it's a great calendar program, you know, just like Calendly and, you know, there's so many on the market. And we sort of realized we need to go and create deep partnerships with them, which is why we created a partnership with Acuity and all the other ones. Um, and now calendar integrations. So now people are booking times of people calendars. So think about that for a second. Before, you had a hard time getting a response from the person. But then when you did, hey, let's book a time. Okay, when works? Tuesday at seven. No, no, no. Let's do Thursday at four. Back and forth, back and forth. And then now all of a sudden, instant calendar booking. So that's the next thing. And then we started to just keep going down. You're like eliminating these friction points, it seems like. Right. So it was just, how do we take out friction from this sales process, right? And and we ended up, you know, and we're still going, we haven't stopped, but, you know, we ended up saying, well, how can you take a credit card? How can you actually go through a contract? How can you actually go do a screen video using the Dub Chrome extension or desktop app where you do a contact, contract walkthrough, have a call to action that goes to a digital sign link, and the person can actually watch a video of you doing a contract, contract walkthrough and then doing a digital signature and completing the contract all asynchronously. So just for the people that are running agencies out there, I know what the sales cycles look like. You know, for every digit that you add to the contract amount, it's it could be another six months of waiting time. You know, I know the loyalty issues. I know that it's like you're you're only as good as your your last campaign. You know, it doesn't matter what you did in the past. Like, like I know some of those challenges because I've worked in the agency world. And I've run agencies and I've worked for, for larger agencies and it's and it's not easy. Just just think what you can do with video. I want to talk, uh, Ruben, we'll get into um, some of the, because you, you mentioned about bringing the humanity back to the process. So in a second, I want to, I want to talk about mistakes people make with outreach. But before we get there, um, I want to know some of the things you learned. I know you have worked, like you said, at some big agencies uh, before, um, Scorpion being one of them. And I'd love to hear uh, some of the learnings from, from Scorpion. Yeah. Scorpion is a fantastic company, you know, Inc. 5000 company um, based at the time I was there, they were based in uh, Santa Clarita, which is ironically now where I live. So on my, in my building where I have a terrace, I can overlook and actually see that building where I used to be employed. And which is kind of interesting and kind of cool. It's sort of a memory. Um, but what's so interesting is that, you know, this is a 200 person sales team at the time. And, you know, the rhetoric was it's hard to get people to, res- to you know, respond to our emails. It's hard to get calendar bookings like before. There's a lot of competitors. When we go to these trade shows, there's competitors, there's, you know, online vendors, there's o- overseas vendors, there's low cost people, there's, you know, industry specific ones. So, you know, competition was fierce, you know which I think is just natural in the, in the marketplace. So how do you, the question really was, how do you differentiate yourself? And how do you, as a salesperson, how do you go get, get that response? You know, and I remember one of the sales reps that sent a first, um, I think it was a screen video of a proposal. 
got a one day close on a five digit deal. And, and that was almost unheard of. And it was like sign on the, sh- on the, on the spot. And it was, I was like, wow, this is, there's something here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's something here. Um, the, the largest deal that I have heard signed via dub, I, I, it's, it's less than 10 million. It's, we have a, a couple of fortune 500 clients. I don't have a specific amount, but there have been some really large deals that have taken place via this type of communication. And I wish I had more specifics and I really wish I I got a commission on these, (laughs) but that unfortunately is not how our pricing structure works. Maybe we'll change that for enterprise, right? (laughs) Um, So you cut your teeth at at Scorpion. Uh, There are any other, I don't know, from a structure standpoint, Mm -hmm. like leadership structure of the company, because you really learn from inside, because I don't know how many, what, what was like, around the staff level at Scorpion? Is it like in the 500, yeah, 600 yeah, people? Yeah, five, five, 600, yep. Yeah. Is there anything two, that you took from just observing, whether it's the culture or the structure of the organization that you took to dub? Well, I think one of the things that I think is really important when we think about leadership, when we think about structure, is this is this idea of having uh, a, an open communication, a transparent um, vibe within a company. And the reason why that's really important is because the people that are on the front lines of the business, like the sales reps and the account managers, they're the ones that are, again, going back to listening, they're the ones that are that are speaking to customers. They're the ones that are getting the objections. They're the ones that are getting the rejections, you know? And by taking that information and having that sort of sprinkle throughout the DNA of the company, we can make improvements. So if there's, if there's n- no communication or ill communication, between that type of customer listening and the the architects of the business, then things start to fall apart. So I think what we are, what we always have tried to do, any organization I've ever been a part of, I've always tried to say, listen, this is what the customers are saying, and now what are we going to do with it? So I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that I have now is you know transparency, communication, and then taking that feedback and then turning it into fuel data that blooms and blossoms the company. You know, your objections, if you understand your objections in a business, it's one of the most valuable things that you can do. Like one of the things that we do, we have a we have a low churn rate, right? Relative to the industry. It's like a six percent churn rate, which I'm I'm proud of, you know. And but when people do cancel for whatever reason, we always do a deep interview. There's a survey, we call them, we text them, we're like, what happened? What went wrong? And you know, we gather that information and then that information we go reinvest back into the business and try to figure out, okay, well, there was a glitch on, you know, Windows uh, 3.0, we should, we should go, you know, do a build for that, or just say, we don't, we don't support that. And then, boom, we're making improvements, you know? So we try to just constantly, it's this this feedback loop. There's a lot of really great books on this, you know, Lean Startup, there's a lot of books on sort of 360 feedback. Um, So I'm definitely a student of this space. Let's talk about some of the mistakes people make with outreach, right? Obviously, you have, you know, someone using Dub, um, it's a very personalized video message. And I know I've heard, you know, I I suggest people check out your YouTube channel. You have some great videos there on the sales process and how you can really use video. And, you know, you're a big proponent on doing deep research. You know, a little research goes a long way a lot of times. But what are some of the mistakes you see people making? You know, I first when I when I say the mistakes that I see people making, I'm going to start with myself with this, just because I don't want to come from a place where I'm pointing my finger at other people making mistakes because I have made a lot of these mistakes my, myself. So I do want to start with some accountability here and some humility. But I remember being in a in a boiler room situation in a in a in a startup, uh, actually the one that you mentioned, Spreeify, and I remember being in a massive scarcity mindset. We don't have enough pipeline. We don't have enough leads. We don't have enough revenue. There's no growth. Our our business model was terribly flawed because we didn't have a recurring revenue model. And it was really stressful for us because we never knew if we were going to get our paycheck. And ironically, one of the interesting things about running an agency, if if in my opinion, if, if you're not doing it the right way, is where you're fronting the cash for the ad spend for the client 
And then you have to go do a net 30, which actually turns out to be net 90, sometimes net 120, if, if you really, if you really get grinded. And all of a sudden you're, you're, you become a bank. You become like the world's worst bank. You're just fronting other people's money. And then if for some reason that they say that there's been no results and we're not going to pay, then you're really screwed. The reason why I'm saying all this is because that type of stress, that type of financial stress for founders, or it, it, it permeates through the entire culture of the business. And if you have this scarcity mindset, if you have this you know, fear mindset about how am I going to get paid and how am I going to drive revenue, then you start to act desperate. And desperation is one of those things where it's, it's, it's so interesting when you think about desperation because it functions in a very similar way to the way that all the factory senses operate. And what I mean by that is that in early, human, early mankind, if a bunch of, if a little family is in a little cave and there's some stench in that cave, no one's actually going to smell that because the way that our nose and our olfactory senses work is that we we sense delta, we sense change. So if we're used to smelling like this every single day, we just smell normal. It's a, it's a survival thing that happens. So when we're desperate, we can't smell <laughs> the desperation on us, but boy, does it reek to other people. And now let's dissect that a little bit. What does desperation look and feel like? Well, it's long emails. It's emails that are, you know, overthought. It's emails that are selfish with the word I too much, that lack empathy, that lack value, that lack an understanding of what the other person is going through, that that lack the the research, the necessary research required to understand who a pro, what a prospect is and what they're going through. You know, instead of saying, I do this and I've done this and I've worked with all these companies and I'm I'm amazing. Instead of actually focusing on what the other person is going through based on the research that you've done, because you've had the time, the abundance mindset to give you the time to understand them. If you mix all that together with desperation, it's it's just not good. You know? Um, let's let's think abundantly, let's invest the time, let's bring the humanity back. Let's actually not go for the sale. Let's not go for the kill. Let's actually go for the relationship. You know, let's not close more deals. Let's open more relationships. Love it. Let's talk about a real world example and what someone did. Um, Chris is a good example. Yeah. What Chris happened with Chris? Patrick? Yeah. Chris Kirkpatrick, life180.com. He's a, he's a, he's a great life coach. Um, he had a really interesting story and actually I have my Kindle here. So let me grab it. Here's my Kindle. But what he did was he's an, an old time dub uh, subscriber and he's had some great wins on the platform. And he had some, he had his, uh, you mentioned your dream 100, right? And I think he references a book. And I, I, unfortunately, I can't remember the book right now that he references, but may, is it called Dream 100? Maybe Chet no. Holmes. Chet Holmes uh, Bingo. talked about Dream 100, yeah. Bingo. That's the book right there. Thank you so much. I have not read that book, but I intend to. Um, so he said, look, I've got my Dream 100. Um, yeah, I had Amanda Holmes on the podcast talking. Her dad, unfortunately passed away, but she talked about the book and I think they did a new addition uh, to the book. Um, I think it's called The Ultimate Sales Machine. Boom, there but it is. But it's about the Dream 100. Yeah, There it is, perfect. So when we think about the Dream 100, uh, my interpretation of that is who are 100 dream clients, right? These are our ideal client profile, the contract size is, is, is good, the fit, cultural fit's great, everything's spot on, right? So now how do we go turn 100 into 10 meetings, and then close two of those meetings. It's a 2% conversion rate, right? How do we go do that, right? So his premise was, let me go and use Dub, send video messages from my phone as a one touch point of my screen as a second touch point, showing very specifically what that company is going through, like going to their website, going to their press releases, doing narrated screen videos, explaining how he could actually help in this whole process. and then. The third thing that he did was to actually take his videos, upload them to Kindles. An Amazon Kindle device this is 60 bucks. You can actually get these for 60 bucks. You can actually get them for even like 30 bucks refurbished on eBay, apparently. And you can upload a video to a Kindle. You can send it in a nicely packaged box. You have to put some click me or sorry, yeah, click me here and then swipe up because that's the first thing that you want the person to do when they open this, this gift, this corporate gift. You want them to click the button 
and then swipe up and then boom, the video is playing of you explaining how you can provide value to them, right? Non-salesy, relationship focused. And then of course, he, he followed up with some more video emails using Dub, which is great. He got the activity reporting. So you could actually see when people were watching the videos and then he knew when to pick up the phone. And then he landed the, the YouTube video that we did, how to land a $3.4 million deal, which is on our YouTube channel, Rev Show. Um, the the contract was three point four million dollars, but re- actually very recently, a week ago, um, last Wednesday, in our uh, in our webinar, he actually told us that that contract is now ten million dollars because now it's been some time and they've renewed multiple times and they've expanded the contract. So actually, the video should be called "How to Close a Ten Million Dollar Deal." <laughs> Got to update that. <laughs> so what did he do? Talk about the video itself. So what in the video that he put yeah. on the Kindle? Yeah. What yeah, so it was it was an introductory video. Um, he did plenty of research. You know, one of the things that I think makes your podcast what it is is because of the research that you've done. And you know, I had a chance to kind of research your research and research the shows that you've done. And obviously, the reason why you've landed the guests that you have with all those amazing names is because you put time in and you understand people, and it's that relationship build, and that's just continued to kind of scale itself. And how impressive is that? So. Congratulations to you. It's very impressive. Thank um, you. But I think the, the key here, and I'm preaching to the choir, is research. You know, understanding who is this person? What are their goals professionally, personally? What sports teams are they into? Like, do you want to buy them some Cubs tickets? Do you want to send them a video, uh, a YouTube video of something interesting that happened at the Super Bowl? What it, What is it that's relevant for them um, on a personal or professional basis? Uh, it all comes down to the research. But I also have to always add, you can't be salesy in this process. You have to let the relationship ha- happen organically the way that it's going to happen. Maybe very similar to how podcast conversations happen. Organic, non-salesy. Love it. Let's talk about an ad agency, a large ad agency, yeah. uh, and what happened with that. Yeah, I mean, um, the the biggest problem, in my opinion, it with we have a whole section um, for agencies in our technology. And there's some original content that we've created for agencies, and you know, this idea of account based marketing. the The good thing about it is that contract sizes are 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 big. You can you can diversify your offerings and make things really really juicy, and you can you can be an agency of record for years, if not decades, which is amazing. The problem is that um, the second- I'm just video- showing, if you're watching the video, we're here on um, dub.com. And uh, you know they have a lot of industries that they help with. This one in particular uh, is industries backslash agencies. So you can see some of their specific content for agencies, but, but keep yeah, going. Yeah, there you go. There's some, there's some logos there. But um, the interesting thing is that competition is probably the number one um, challenge that people go through when running an agency because- there's cost cutting, there's overseas, there's, um, we want to go specific, we want general, we want an all in one solution, you know, we can't work with you anymore. So there's a lot of different reasons why people might, uh, clients might say, actually, we cannot work with you anymore, where the loyalty just kind of sort of dissipates, right? So the way that we've figured out to solve this problem is, you know, how do we increase communication? How do we increase transparency? You know, I remember working for an agency, and I will not mention the name, but the there was zero transparency from week to week. No one, no one would know what was happening to our ad accounts. Like, what was where was money being spent? What are the conversions? We had no idea what was happening, and we had to wait for that one hour meeting every week. And in that meeting, how can you expand on information if you only have one hour to talk about seven or eight different topics? So we always recommend to people you know, increase the amount of communication that you're doing throughout the process, send them a three minute video, giving them an update on what's new with Facebook. You know, how are those TikTok ads performing? How are those LinkedIn, you know, $15 CPC ads performing there? Are they actually driving conversions? You know, give that type of information as quickly and as often as possible. And then if you can use a platform, you know, there's Rike, I think that one is a popular one. You know, there's Asana, there's Bootcamp, there's Monday.com. There's so many different platforms out there that allow people to increase their communication. Ironically, we've built a lot of integrations with those so that people can capture videos and just send those videos over. Um, one of the things that we love to say is replace a 30-minute meeting 
with a 30 second video. And what I mean by that is instead of having to jump into a Zoom and go through a bunch of screen recordings or go through a bunch of um, data, some spreadsheets, you know, updates, you can craft a short email and you can have a quick screen video in a very short amount of time that might convey a lot of the most important information. And then of course, this is a dialogue back and forth. But the key here is transparency, you know, communication and, and content really, you know, education, information, and that really builds trust. Yeah, I love that. Um, replace a 30 minute meeting with a 30 second video. I'm sure uh, a lot of agency owners would like that one. Yeah. Watch it. Watch what happens. I mean, you can, it's amazing how you can take six slides and you can turn it into, let's just say a minute long video. It's amazing how how possible that is, you know, if you just get to the core essence of what you're trying to say. It's a pitch. It's a, it's an elevator pitch, you know? Um, the cool thing is that while I'm talking, I can be showing stuff on my screen. So it's visual communication. I don't need to mention those logos. I don't need to say we've worked with X company, Y company, and Z company. That's that's a visual on the on the screen. You know, this is one of the first rules of uh, filmmaking show don't tell so if i were to just say hi it's ruben from dub i wanted to share some information on how we help agencies you know, here's some people that we've worked with here's some case studies that we have and some specific results on some wins i'd uh, love to connect you know if i can show visually what i'm talking about throughout that entire experience um watch what impact that makes and if you can show their website and some of the specific things that you've you've discovered in their world that really makes an impression. Um, when I was in the agency world, one of the things that I loved to do was to find a problem on their website. And I never did this in an arrogant way. I did this always in a very humble way. But I would find something like, oh, your SEO or your domain reputation, or there's a broken link or something, right? ADA compliance, whatever it may be, you know, GDPR, I'd always find something that's kind of noteworthy. I'm just like, hey, I noticed this is something that you should know about. You know, if you ever want to talk about it, I'm happy to be a resource. Or in fact, here's a link that you can do your own research, right? And and all of a sudden, be like, thank you so much for pointing that out. I, I did not know that. And now all of a sudden, they have some internal dialogue. And, you know, either they love me or they hate me at that point because, you know, I found a bug. <laughs> but hopefully there's alignment and, uh, you know, the conversation at least can get started. Yeah, I love that. I mean, adding value is is really the goal and to form a real relationship I love to, you know, Ruben, as I look at the page, if you're watching the video, you can see I'm scrolling down here. I love to hear about the decision of having a, a starter package that's free, right? Um, because, you know, again, this costs you money, right? When you yeah. have a free package, obviously, it's that balance of creating a frictionless process with, you know, running a business. So. Talk about the decision to have a free version. Yeah, it's it's this is one of the levers in the SaaS world um, that that we can do, right? So one of them is there's there's the there's the there's the option where you give a free trial, and then you have to pay, and then there's the option where you have a free option, and then you can stay on the free option or you can upgrade it, right? So those are those are sort of two kind of choices, two options, I would say, in a, in a very specific choice that SaaS founders have to decide upon. And the reason why we chose not to require a credit card, either A, during the sign-up process, or B, after the free trial period, was because we wanted, we understand that it takes time for people to feel comfortable doing videos. There's tech hurdles. There's you know self-confidence issues. There's actually a lot of things that people have to go through in order to finally get comfortable recording video. And, you know, if you think about it, public speaking, people, people are more scared of public speaking than they are to swim with sharks naked. I don't know, <laughs> something funny, right? right? We've all heard that stuff before, right? <laughs> you know, so public speak, I mean, video is, is kind of like a, you know, it's a form of public speaking. I mean, you can click stop or cancel. It's not like you're in a, you know, you're at HubSpot's inbound conference at a big stage with a thousand people in the audience and you forget what you're going to say and you just lose your your stuff. You know, it's not like that. You can, it's a more controlled environment. But at the same time, um, it's, you know, you're, you're on a stage, you know, that your video is out there, maybe in perpetuity. And for some people, there's, there's a confidence hurdle. 
when it comes to that. So we realize if we want to be empathetic, we can't just be like, all right, gun to the head. You got two weeks. If you don't, then you're out. And you, sorry, goodbye. We realize that people need some time with that, right? The other thing is that we realize that if people start to use our platform, then our brand gets out, and similar to Zoom. Now, if you, you sent me a Zoom link, when I saw the Zoom link instantly, it's Zoom. I trust Zoom. I'm going to click on that. I'm not going to have an issue with it. So we have sort of a secondary duty. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. They're sending really, it out. And the free it's got the double logo, it's got the WRL, and people are being exposed. The more videos people are sending, they're being exposed to dub. Yeah, exactly. So that we call there's really two factors of that. One of them is this idea of trying to gain brand ubiquity, which is what Zoom has done. And that that makes it so that when when someone attends a Zoom meeting or fills out a Zoom form, that the conversion rate's much higher because there's trust. You know, they've heard of that that technology. So they don't have they don't have fear about clicking on it. And then the second thing is, you know, our marketing, it's our social coefficient, right? So every person that uses Dub and then sends a video to someone else, our brand gets out there and then theoretically we can get another um, customer. And then what that does is it allows us to A, grow our company, to grow our revenue, but that also allows us to A, reinvest into the business and then B, is keep our costs down. Like we could easily have our cost be $150 per month per user. Like there's a world where that happens, you know, Salesforce SaaS integrations price like that all the time. You know, a lot of coaches even tell, Hey, 10 extra prices and watch what happens. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to stay a little bit reasonable. We wanted to make it so that, you know, super reasonable. It's, it's a volume play. Yeah. It's a volume play. That's what, that's what you sort of have to do in SaaS. You know, I think that's a sign of a healthy SaaS company where they figured out how can I get some level of scale? But of course, we don't want to give away our technology because we want to invest in it. And people associate value with based on the perception, right? So if we were to make our prices a dollar, we'd actually probably do a lot, a lot worse <laughs> because people would have a very, you know, poor perceived value. <laughs> yeah. No, I love this. It's super, it's almost like a no-brainer for a company, I think. Um how hard was it to get the URL? Dub. Ten grand. It, dubb.com seems like it's a Ten it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. We started out as dub.co, and then I was trying to get dub.com. I always love the word dub. I, it's like a recording. There's something interesting. Makes sense. Dub, like like rims. You know, that was there's that whole thing, like car rims. You know, dub is like a uh, car rims over twenty inches. It's kind of a funny subculture. So it's, it kind of rolled off the tongue. And um, so, you know, early on in the process, um, we I sort of made that a target. Like, I'm going to go acquire that domain. And I started to negotiate and I started to go back and forth with the owner at the time. And we landed on that price. Uh, God, to get a four-letter domain name now, that's a, that's a word in, in the lexicon. It's, it's, it's become very expensive, very expensive. So we've had some significant offers on that domain. Um, but we're like, Hey, we're running a business. Sorry. We're not just going to sell our domain here. <laughs> you get funny emails, but, but, you know, I would encourage people to, you know, dot coms are cool, but they're not, they're not essential anymore. There's a lot of great domains out there. Dot AI, dot IO, um, dot, um, dot co is a great one. Dot agency. I mean, that's a, that's a cool one. If you're an agency dot agency, I like that, you know? So I would say, don't get too stuck on the domain. It, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. Your brand, your logo, your feeling, your essence, that really what that's really what matters. How are people, Ruben, using the SMS campaigns and two-way SMS messaging? I don't think I've ever seen a video platform have those features. Yeah, definitely. I'm 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 able to do a screen share in, in a moment if you'd like to see that. But yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll just kind of sort of set us up here. So I think what's really interesting about SMS. By the way, Ruben has no idea what I what I was asking on this on this whole call. So, but uh, but thanks for playing along. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. thank you, thank you for that. Um, I'm always ready, but um, unless I'm not. So, so the interesting thing about SMS is that SMS is sort of like the wild west of marketing. There's not a there there are there is some regulation. But there's not regulation and sort of etiquette rules the same way that there are with email. If you if you misbehave in email, you will get punished. Period. There is absolutely no way around this. 
Google and Outlook and all the other email servers out there have figured out ways to figure out if you're master, mass blasting emails. And if enough people report your domain or your email as spam, you're done, you're finished. And then you have to start from scratch. You have to warm up a domain and then go through the whole process again. So we there's sort of this vested interest if we are going to email market to have really good email hygiene, to make sure we clean our list, to make sure that we understand who we're sending this out to. Because if we if we misbehave, once again, we're going to get blocked. With SMS, it's not quite like that just yet. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is not because people should take advantage of this medium. That's not why I'm saying this. The reason why I'm saying this is because we all need to do the diligence to understand how we can have really good SMS, right? Campaigns, how we can actually go through the process. Who, when are we allowed to send an SMS to someone? You know, can we go buy a list of phone numbers and just, you know, cold SMS people? What is that going to I've never heard of someone doing that, but yeah. Right? What does that yeah. look like? And um, these are really important questions to ask ourselves. At the end of the day, just, just ask yourself, what kind of SMS, you know, mass SMS have you responded to? If someone sent you a cold SMS, what did that look like? You know, did you actually say, yeah, I'd love to click on that and fill out that form or put my credit card in? Or did you say stop, unsubscribe? <laughs> you know. So the thing I have to I have to start with that preface. Um, you know, here's how to it's very easy to send an SMS campaign on dub. You configure your sender, Twilio. I like Twilio, um, simple texting, sales message, Amazon, couple, you know, configurations. You can decide which one's best for you. Um you know, you put your message in with some personalization script, first name. This way, you know, every person, Dub has a CRM system. So every person, every contact in your CRM that has a first name will actually have the first name displayed in the text message. And then, of course, have a link right here. Um, and that link um, produces, depending if it's an iPhone or an Android, it it um, displays like, an, like a thumbnail, like an image, a thumbnail for the link itself. It's called the meta OG image. So that's, that sometimes looks nice. And then you select a video. And then you just send it, right? You just blast it out. You send this out, save it, and then go to your campaign builder, and then poof, it's gone. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can build an automated workflow. So for example, if I wanted to have an automated workflow and say everyone that did X, like filled out a form, I added them to the CRM, I could create a task for myself, and then I could also create an action that sends an SMS. And here I have send email or SMS. And then I can, of course, select my SMS that I just wrote and then have this trigger and send, right? So once again, I would recommend that people do their research to figure out, you know, what is the right etiquette? I would say do not SMS cold contacts. It's You're going to get a lot of stops and unsubscribes and some hate mail. Don't do that. In fact, the provider might even block you. <laughs> so just do your research. However, if you do get people's phone numbers on a form, opt in. This is a great way to send them an ebook. This is a great way to send them a calendar booking link. This is a great way to send them that acuity link or a YouTube video because they opted in and that's just efficient because our devices are right in our pocket and the open rate on SMS is 98%. In your platform, it's two way. So if they respond, two -way, yeah. can you respond back then within the platform? Definitely. Yeah. You can send a message hmm. back. Um, we so I could see people using it for their clients. Possibly because yeah. clients sometimes just want to respond via text, but yeah. you, know, you don't want to give out personal cell phones. So yeah. in your, do they, when you're using it in dub, are they opting in? Are you sending a message to opt in or are you just sending them a message? Cause you, you know, you have yeah, them as us, a contact. Yeah. For us, it's all opt in. Um, what happens here is that someone will sign up to dub and, they will, I just kind of gave a sneak peek of what that two-way SMS looks like. It's just a traditional kind of yeah. SMS thing. It's also available on the mobile, on the Dub mobile app. But I think what's interesting for us is that if someone signs up to Dub and then they put their mobile phone number in, then we have to, we do a verification and then we send them a link so that they can attend the training. And that has been positive. We, we don't get, we don't get um, angry, you know, stop unsubscribe messages to that because they, they signed up, they filled out a form and now we're provided providing education, you know, and, and then for the record, we don't, we're not salesy in the, in the trainings or the webinars that we host either, because that's just going to cause, you know, sort of a bad experience. Yeah. First of all, 
Ruben, I want to thank you. I have one last question. Um, before we end, I want to point people to check out dub.com, D-U-B-B.com to learn more. It's a, it's a really slick platform. Uh, I've used it myself. So thanks for the value you create and provide for people. My last question is um, mentors on this journey in entrepreneurship. Um, who are some of the mentors that stick out to you and, and maybe a piece of advice that they've given you? Yeah, I really, I really like this question. You know, I, I think that for me, my first mentor is my father. And the specific thing that I learned from my dad is to talk to strangers. Because, you know, we grow up, a lot of us are, are taught to not talk to strangers. But in fact, talking to strangers is where you learn about humanity. <laughs> and I remember as a young kid, I would be embarrassed when he would talk to, you know, the, the taxi cab driver or the person at the coffee shop or the restaurant and just someone stranger on the street. Right. And I'd feel embarrassed. And I'd you know, like do that whole thing with my elbow saying, stop, stop embarrassing. Me. And then I realized what he was doing because at some point the knowledge was starting to sort of self-perpetuate. And, and as he started to talk to more people, he knew more things. And then all of a sudden I remember it was like a, I was, I put the puzzle together. I was like, Oh, he talks to people so that he can learn. And then he talks to more people and then he shares the information that he learns from those other people. And then he's just expanding the knowledge base. And it's basically like the internet in your brain. You know? And it was, and it was, and I, and I was learning and I was quietly learning throughout this entire process. So I think the importance of, of really listening to people is so valuable. You know, if you notice in, um, in, in society, you know, some of the most successful people are, are in fact, some of the most quiet people. Um, you know, this is an old Confucius quote, you know, um, wise man, no speak, dumb man speak, you know, so listening, I think is a really important thing. So I learned that from my father, for sure. You know, I think Napoleon Hill, um, I think he taught us to burn the boats. And I, th I think that on another podcast, you know, we should talk about this idea of, you know, taking care, taking uh, your safety net out, like what would happen if you actually did that, you know, like if you're forced to be successful you know, burn the boats, you know, Google that one. That's, that's a cool story. Um, General Cortez, kind of a violent um, story, but. Ruben, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out dub.com or episodes of the podcast. And thanks everyone. Thanks Ruben. Thank you so much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand